Executive Director of the Latches, and I'm very, very happy to welcome you to the wonderful Latches Theater. So glad we're all here today. I told Gordon Hayward backstage, it feels like all our friends and family are right here. It's great to see you all. Um, as I was um, thinking about the right words uh, to greet you with, I turned to a favorite person of mine and a close friend of the Latches, Ken Burns, uh, who once remarked, uh, I've learned time and again that you can discover the extraordinary within the ordinary. And that's what I love about history and what I love about coming to work at the Latches every day. Life here is rife with the possibility of discovering the extraordinary. The Latches itself is something extraordinary that just happens to be found in the last place you'd look for it, the heart of a small Vermont town. At least once a week I show this theater to someone who has never seen it and the reaction is always the same. Their eyes open wide, their jaws drop, and invariably they will say, I had no idea this was here. They just discovered our extraordinary. Even for those of us who are familiar with the Latches, it is never old hat. The feeling that we are in the midst of something extraordinary is palpable. We are here tonight to stoke those fires some more and do a little more digging, a little more of what Ken Burns calls the emotional archeology span of history. Hidden in plain sight will lead us all to a heightened sense of extraordinary. But I also think tonight is about the inverse of Burns's comment. We are here tonight to celebrate the ordinary within the extraordinary. As extraordinary as the Latches is, and as uniquely gifted as the people in our story are, the Latches is also the happy creation of some people who are extraordinary for their basic humanity. They are ordinary like us. They are husbands and wives, fathers and mothers, sons and daughters, families and strangers who quickly become like family. And like us, they simply live their lives with passion, industry, resilience, resolution, and love. Above all, love. It has been a labor of love to see this event take shape and to find the words to talk about it. It has always been my hope that this event not only shines light on the glories that abound in this extraordinary place, but that it might inspire us to find what's hidden in plain sight all around us. A dear friend of mine in town sent me an email expressing, along with her genuine regret at being out of town tonight, exactly what I've been hoping for. She wrote, I have long wished for exactly this kind of in-depth focus on these local works, especially to incorporate some explaining of the different aspects, Greek mythology, artistic value of the works, Latches family connection, etc." so much hidden in plain sight, exactly. In fact, I think that is the key overall to understanding that what the town of Brattleboro is, so much hidden in plain sight. So let's find out together. To begin this revealing evening, uh, in addition to asking you to please silence your cell phones, <laughs> I am proud to introduce Gordon Hayward, president of the Latches Arts Board. Thank you all so much for being here tonight to help us celebrate this extraordinary room. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, recognize Charles Mallory. Charles, are you here in the audience? Charles Mallory was extraordinarily generous in sponsoring this event, which means that 98% of your ticket price has gone directly to support the work of Latches Arts. So we thank you, Charles. Uh, I'd also like to uh, recognize any members of the theater or hotel staff that are in the audience. Could you stand, please? These are the You have no idea of the loyalty uh, behind ke what keeps this building running. There are 20 employees looking after this place. 
The woman who is in charge of the hotel rooms has been here for 18 years in that position. Travis has been here in looking after this acre and a half of building for many years. So we thank you all. Could any members who are here from the Latches Arts Board please stand? Thank you. And members of the Latches Corporation Board, please stand. Oh, well done. There, there are um, no end of examples of the work that these two boards are doing, but suffice it to say that without them, the Latches would have collapsed. Uh, in 2003, these two boards, the Latches Arts Board being a nonprofit, the Latches Corporation Board, which oversees the theater and the hotel, are a for profit board. And it's a total of about 20 of us who are your custodians of this building. Uh, I'd also like to recognize Gen Jennifer Kramer. I'm not certain that she's here. But Jennifer and her students uh, in the eighth grade at the Guilford Center School uh, wrote a, uh, a summary and a, a, an explication of all of the murals many years ago. And uh, she really broke some, some ground in starting that idea. So I'd like now to introduce our first speaker, uh, who is Anne Latches. Uh, she is also known as Angeliki. Uh, Anne is the great-granddaughter of the Latches family patriarch, Demetrius Latches, who emigrated from the mountain village of Kastanitsa in the Arcadia region of the Peloponnese in Greece in 1901. It was not until 1970s that roads finally made their way to this village. Up until that point, since the time of the early, early uh, 800s, um, people could only walk to that village in the mountains. So Anne is the daughter of Jim Latches, who ran the theater here for many years before turning the complex over to Anne's brother, Spiro, and his wife, Elizabeth. So without further ado, Anne Latches. Look how lucky we are. We're all here. Isn't that great? Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight for a rich evening of art, where Cupid and Eros meet Cleo in our Greco Deco atmospheric theater. I was asked to tell a brief history tonight, about spanning about 115 years. Um, but I realized I didn't really know the whole story. And also, I'm not quite that old. But um, so Gordon Hayward announced that he was undertaking a task to amass a comprehensive history of not only the Latches family businesses and Louis Jambour's history and works. At that point, I realized what a gift he was giving to my family and to an, our entire community. So thank you, Gordon. I can speak from my extended family that we are so grateful for your devotion to this historic landmark. I lost it. Uh, I'm going to spare you the Wikipedia version of the Latches family history and encourage you to read his book once it's published. So instead, I'm offering an abbreviated version of that story, along with a few choice memories of what it was like growing up here for me. This portrait is of Demetrius Peter Latches, as painted by Louis Jambour, our muralist. This is from a photograph of my great grandfather. This hung in the hotel lobby for as long as I can remember. Sometimes I'd see a jolly Santa Claus-like character, and other times I'd gaze in awe of his courage and his tenacity to create a new life for his family of seven children in the early 20th century as an immigrant from Greece. He was the first Latches to come to the United States in 1901 from a small mountain village of Kastanitsa in the Arcadia region of the Peloponnesus. Here's the village. 
Now, as you can see, it's surrounded by hills on all sides, and this tucked away village was missed altogether from any destruction during World War II. I'm not sure what season this is, but believe me, I've seen pictures with snow. So no one usually pictures snow in Greece, but he definitely moved from a mountainous, colder region to a, a similar climate here. He traveled alone here at 37 with an expecting wife and two sons back in Greece when he decided to settle in Hinsdale. The Ellis Island entry lists him as having $10 in his pocket. The Bardas family had come from the same village in Greece and landed in Keene, so my great-grandfather, wanting to strike it out on his own, decided to settle in nearby Hensdale, where he would walk to Brattleboro to meet the train from Boston to buy fruit and pull a handcart to Brattleboro, nearby Northfield, and occasionally to Chesterfield. That's a hand truck going in a tri-state region. That's a lot of miles. <laughs> there is an Ellis Island document that I have, and I'm sorry it, it didn't show up here, but um, in it, we have the one from 1901 we found. We also have one from 1908. And um, it's tiny, tiny writing. Actually, I have one here. I don't think you can see them. But it's the manifest from the ship. And the handwriting is very hard to decipher. But I did find the family name. And there was a word under uh, what his employment was. And it was called fruiterer. Has anyone ever heard that word before or after? I mean, a fruiterer? So here's a, a picture of the fruit cart. This is actually the fruit, one of the fruit carts that was actually on a truck. And he did start selling bananas and oranges. And um, it's pretty impressive. So the, the name originally was Latsis. And you can see on this slide up here in Greek, L-A-T-S-I-S. The H is an I. Now, I have my own theory about how the name changed from lat Latsis to Latches. I made this up. So, you know, no one's, no one's uh, told me otherwise. But I'm just thinking that he had written it or that they had seen it on his passport in Greek, seen the H, which is an I, threw that in there, changed his name from L-A-T-S-I-S to L-A-T-C-H-I-S. So somehow the H and the I got in there together. And I'm pretty sure that's how the name came to be. I could be wrong. So anyway, Demetrius, known locally as James, eventually returned to Greece in 1908 and returned to America with his two teenage sons, Spiro and Peter. My grandfather, Spiro, being the oldest. The boys were two years apart. And I understand there was a little bit of lying on their age to get them in the country because they were, I think, too young to be here. But anyway, in 1911, he returned again to Greece and brought his wife, Thelma, his son, Emmanuel, daughters Helen and Martha with him, and they were living in Hinsdale at the time. They soon afterward moved to Brattleboro, first to Brook Street, and then to Homestead Place. This is um, up off South Main Street in the cemetery, the Morningside Cemetery. This is the corner of Flat Street and Main Street where this building is now. You can see... Oh, you can see the Sam's building. Maybe you can recognize that. So this is the building that they purchased in 1921 and put um, Vaudeville Theater in on Flat Street. So need to go a little bit back. I'm going to tell you a little story. So this, this picture is there anyway. And uh, we might come back to this other picture. But anyway, the entrepreneurial family business evolved over the next 20 years from selling bananas and oranges in the tri-state area with a hand-pushed cart to being the only ice cream vendor in town at the High Life Confection Shop. And that was in the mid-teens. And that shop preceded the move here. And it's the stores were exactly where the co-op parking lot entrance is now. There was a row of stores there. And that's where the first uh, business was, the Latches business, called the High Life Confectioners. Uh, then they bought this in 1921 and had moved the fruit and candy company into this building and right around the corner, let's see if that's here, there's the, Latch, the first Latches Theater in the 20s that was a vaudeville theater and also showed silent films. That's the inside of the old theater, uh, the original theater. Oop. You can see through the back of there, you're looking across Flat Street. If you were standing in the Flat Street pub right now, that would be the view looking out across Flat Street. So the theater ran from Flat Street back, you know, straight back from where the bar is right now. And there was a balcony there. And that was all since torn down uh, to make way for this building. 
By the time of my great-grandfather's death in 1932, he owned six theaters in New England. My great-uncle Peter, the second oldest, was by all memories the creative mastermind of the Latches Memorial Building and the movie theater, which was a tribute to his father. Peter and his oldest brother, my grandfather Spiro, started building the present Latches Building in the height of the Depression in 1936. It was completed in 1938 and looked much the same as it does tonight. Over the years, the Latches family owned and operated 15 movie theaters in Vermont, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. The Colonial Theater in Keene was one of, that many of you have probably been to. This was a brochure when the hotel was built in 1938. You can see the coffee shop. There was a gift shop. There was a ballroom. Um, it was quite a swanky place for Brattleboro. <laughs> All right, this is the back of this theater. You can see the ceiling, and uh, maybe I can talk and look at the same time. What I wanted to show here is that originally the aisles went straight back out into the lobby here. And uh, when my brother had the theater, we put a smaller theater in the back, which put that back wall closer. So the exit is now around the side over there. But you can see the original um, back walls of the theater there and the balcony. And this, I'm going to go back and forth here. There we are today, and there we are a few years back, 1938. And so you can see the freeze is up above. I mean, the difference is color. They hadn't invented color in the world. The, the movie theater was black and white back then. <laughs> but I think it's pretty great to look back and forth at these and see how similar they are. Many of the original decorative features from 1938 are still here. In fact, some are hidden in plain sight. This terrazzo star is at the hotel lobby entrance. It's important. So if you go back through the lobby, try to go out through the front door and start. Just look down and look at some of the decorative uh, floor designs. Other than the zodiac is the one everybody notices, but there's several other interesting spots. This frieze above you only see if you're looking up when you're coming down the stairs. I don't advise it if it's dark, but um, <laughs> if you get a minute to pause on a stair and look up, you'll see this. And that's when you're coming down from the um, balcony or the ballroom theater. Um, I'll just note that you should take a look at some of the molding out in the theater and some of the other special um, little spots here and there where you can see some beautiful decorative art. These two pictures show some change over time. The picture on the left is of the coffee shop, and there are Greek murals in there. That was the restaurant that was the, the hotel restaurant. Um, when I was growing up, it was here, and it had many transformations from that eventually to a restaurant called the Billboard Restaurant. Then it went on to be the China Moon, and then the Jade Wa, New England Youth Theater. There's been several uh, changes within that space, and right now it's Latches Four Theater. So you can see the, t the two. One's looking toward the back, and this is looking the opposite direction toward the front. Okay, I'm jumping ahead here. This is 1929. I bet there's a few people out there that can read this. This is my grandparents' wedding invitation. This name up here is Eleniki and Spiro. DHM is the apostrophe for Demetrius, I guess, and it says Latsi. Um, so anyway, my grandfather returned to Greece in 1929 to find his wife. And actually, there's a story. I would love to know more about that. <laughs> so here are my grandparents on their honeymoon. They, went, they married in Greece and then went through Paris before they came here. Her nickname was Kula. She was from a coastal town of Astros in the eastern Peloponnesus. She passed away the year before I was born, but I was christened with her name. Her English was very limited, but I do know she was a regular at the movies. 
so I can only imagine some of the English via Hollywood one-liners she may have picked up from Betty Davis and the like. So, Dad, I'm, I'd love to hear some stories someday. <laughs> All right, this is going back now to the passport of my grandfather when he went back to Greece to get his wife. So there's the Greek passport, this picture. These are all documents that were found in a safe in the hotel um, probably about three or four years ago. The safe had been locked, no one had ever drilled in, and finally uh, Travis said, we gotta get in there, Let's, we wanna know what's inside. So they drilled the safe open and found um, a lot of documents from my family, and this was a real treasure to find my grandfather's passport and his uh, original wedding invitation. So there's my grandfather um, in one of the candy shops, and I'm not sure at this point which one this is, but you can see that the shop, there were three or four different ones um, based on different pictures we have. All right. Now we're gonna jump ahead, and I wanted to let you all know that Eloise was my personal avatar, long before I had ever even heard that word. She had been my all-time favorite book character from the age of five. I'd never been to New York City where she lived. I certainly had never visited the Plaza Hotel, and I didn't have a pet turtle on a leash, nor a nanny. What I did have Oh, we're gonna go back, these are, <laughs> so let's jump back. 19 years from when the hotel was built, I was born, this was my baby announcement in the form of a new, new movie ticket. <laughs> so it looks like I was destined to pop popcorn and watch movies, or maybe be a Hollywood star, but look where I am. <laughs> I think you all know what happened there. <laughs> And I don't know where this, I've just kept this all these years. It's about yay big with a little, you know, tear off. My brothers didn't get such a nice treatment that I did. <laughs> okay, so although I wasn't Eloise in New York, I did have my very own small Brattleboro Hotel with an elevator. I had secret cellar passageways. I had a fallout shelter, otherwise known as a windowless dungeon filled with canned food. There were hotel rooms with 25 cent magic fingers and a ballroom for my grade school sleepover parties. I also had a coffee shop where I'd write my own orders for crab meat sandwiches, pop in and out of the swinging doors to the kitchen. This world was my oyster. So what other kid had a candy room? My papu, which is named for my grandfather, he'd occasionally forget to lock the door. Junior Mints and Good and Plenty were my favorites. I'd sneak to show my friends the access to backstage, which proved a very cool place to be during a show. And there were these Frankenstein-like switches on the wall, which are still there. We'd pretend to electrocute ourselves. We'd pull them and you know, do that thing. <laughs> but most important of all, there were free movies. This was my very own cinema paradiso. Um, free movies. Actually, there's no such thing as free movies. I gotta clarify that. I started working here at age 11. Actually, I think it was 10, but anyway. Somewhere around the time I was learning my multiplication tables at Green Street School, and the Red Sox were living the impossible dream. Working the concession stand was a tightly run operation. I can tell you a couple stories about that. Everything was done um, in your head or by pencil and paper. We'd come in, we'd have to count all of the different popcorn boxes and cups, and at the end of the night, all the accounting done was done by how many were left. So you had to match penny to penny uh, for pretty much everything. And um, when people would come and say two popcorns, a soda, three sugar babies, and you know whatever, you'd have to add in your head as you went along. So. Um, there were no adding machines at the time, and um, I got good at adding numbers, but you know that was about the extent of my math there. <laughs> but um, one employee, there's a great story that sort of stuck with the family. He was so distressed over being 25 cents short on popcorn money one evening, he finally figured out his mistake, and he announced, I put the sugar babies in the popcorn. This came to be a family joke and a warning to all. Keep the candy and popcorn sales tightly monitored. <laughs> so working the ticket booth, um, that was another one of my jobs. I would sit out there in the summer and the winter 
and watch the cars go by in the summer and be very social and wave to everybody. It was it was a lot of fun at age 14. and uh, But in the winter, it was freezing, and there was a little nasty little heater that would send sparks out and burn the hair on my legs. And <laughs> it was a little dangerous, but um, I, I remember many, many cold and nights in that, that little space. Let's see. Oh, now we're going back in time again. Sorry about this. Um, this, I don't know if you can see this, but I'm going to rifle back here and read to you what's on that sign. This is National Candy Day. Judging by all these signs. It was October 6th, Saturday. So I did a little research and found all the October 6th Saturdays that existed and uh, pretty much narrowed it down to 1923. And what it says there, candy is pure and wholesome, higher in food value than bread or meat. <laughs> That's the sign over here to the right of the door. Serve candy for dessert. <laughs> And uh, Nationwide Candy Day. I think this is great. So you see the fruit. There was a <laughs> so um, in front there is probably my, my dad thinks that's my great aunt Helen. And inside the doorway, it's kind of fuzzy, so it's hard to see. But if you look carefully at these two trucks, this is very interesting. That truck over there was an ice cream truck, had a sign on it. And this one here is the same shape as this cart. I don't know if there can be some lights on the cart, but um, it's the same body that went on the truck. This one was the fruit cart because it had some painting on it like that. And this one um, just said fruit dealer, but you can tell the art is different on them. So there must have been several of them, but we're very lucky that this one survived. It's been in my barn for a few years now when we just brought it out yesterday. Okay. I think we're going to jump forward here. Oh, here's a here's a picture of the third floor. Uh, th these are now two hotel rooms, but there was a solarium up there and a little uh, sitting room for hotel guests. If you stand in the co-op parking lot and look up over the back of the theater, you can see those windows and a little sort of a little light structure up there. So that's still visible from the co-op side. Oh, one thing I wanted to tell you about. I had some major achievements while I worked here when I was young. I could stand, standing, I could toss, I counted, 64 times popcorn that I would catch in my mouth. That was, that was my record. And, and the summer I was 12 years old, I watched Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid well over 20 times. And I can't say I really watched it because I was working, so I'd miss the first five to ten minutes in the last five to ten minutes, but I saw the bulk of the middle of the movie. So anyway, the entire family worked here. In fact, practically the whole town worked here at some point. The hotel and theater was a family-run business where many who grew up in Brattleboro, uh, where many who grew up in Brattleboro had their first jobs here. Theater ushers, hotel bellboys, concessions, projectionists, restaurant workers, and so on. Now everything is crazy. There was, uh, I don't know, we're not going to get some of these, I guess. I had a picture of the Townhouse Lounge um, in 1971. There was a bar, in which is in Flat Street now. There was a bartender. Um, oh, I wanted to say that quite a few people in town had their first job here. So still today, I'll go in and out of businesses, and people will remind, remind me that they worked here when they were 16, and things like that. Um, but there's a few people that you might know. Um, there was a bartender named Mort that worked at my dad's bar. I remember him. <laughs> and when Amy, oh, here it is. When um, you can see downstairs, that's where Flat Street is now, and the new hotel there. When Amy came to Brattleboro, she was the baker for my brother's restaurant. Matthew Blau worked, first worked here before going on to open Max's and Fireworks. Um, something else unique to our family were our Christmas dinners. We had to eat early enough, usually around 2.30. And yeah, Thanksgiving, yeah, and um, clean up because we all had to get to work that night. The whole family would go down. It was often the busiest day of the year, and we would very often let the staff have the night off. So um, we would be there. Sometimes in the winter blizzards, the hotel would overbook, and my parents would say, send them up to our house. So very often we'd have to shuffle around late at night and 
bring some hotel guests into the house. The building started going through many changes in the 60s and 70s and into the mid-80s when my brother Spiro and his wife Elizabeth began restorations. Um, the theater, the hotel, there was a brew pub, a restaurant downstairs, and also adding on two additional stream, screens, the Jewel Theater, oops, and the, um, the Ballroom Theater. Oh, there we are. Okay, 1969. I put this picture in, I call this the ugly years, but <laughs> that's in our backyard on Putney Road. And that's one of the few pictures I have of all of us. Um, and because my little sister came later, so there was a ton of pictures before her. But I had just started working in the theater the summer before that, so that sort of was an important picture for me to show. And I don't know, you remember Spiro, he's in the back with my dad. Charles is here in the audience tonight, he's in front of me, my mom Marina, and my little sister Beth. So now we're going to jump ahead to 1985. Anyway, uh, right before Hurricane Gloria visited us, I moved back to Vermont from San Francisco at that time, and literally, I got out of the car from a cross-country drive in my 65 Rambler, and without unpacking a thing, I walked in the door to work a shift in the theater. I mean, they just looked at me and said, oh, somebody's not here, can you, you know, so. <laughs> the next morning, 8 a.m., I was on the front desk. I'd like to say I felt right at home, but somehow the welcoming committee just didn't get that memo that I was showing up. So um, we've got a lot more to share with you tonight about the history of the Latches Memorial Theater and the unveiling of Clio, but I'd like to end with one last personal recollection. Several, several years ago, the Vermont Symphony Orchestra played here, and I remember feeling I just got a shudder of joy to see every seat filled and then to hear the live orchestra performing. My thoughts immediately went to my grandfather and to my great aunts and uncles who built this legacy from his fruit cart venture over 100 years earlier. And I can only imagine how proud and delighted they would feel to see the success of their vision and determination as reflected in the audience's appreciation for this lovely theater where we all are today. So I'd like to thank, my grat I'd like to thank that my gratitude for you the Latches Arts supporters in our community reflects the same appreciation that my forebears would have felt if they could be here tonight to experience this. So I do offer a heartfelt thank you to all our patrons and supporters of this legacy to our town. Thank you. One of the advantages of being a bit of a history buff is that the pleasure of making new friends is not limited to people you meet in person. It has been one of the great pleasures of preparing for this event to get to know Louis Jambor, and I'd like you to get to know him a little bit better too. We'll go back in time to September 22, 1938, the day this building opened. The Brattleboro Reformer wrote, quote, when the Latches Theater opens tonight, its patrons will be privileged to see one more evidence of the rare ability of the Hungarian-born artist Louis Jambor. Great excitement attended the opening, which included a convocation by the rector of St. Michael's Episcopal Church, live music, and much other fanfare. Still, there was plenty of excitement about the murals. Few people realize what has been going on so long in secrecy, the reformer continued. It is the hope of the Latches brothers that the authentic Greek motif would be worked out by an artist whose handling of the subject would place the work in the list of outstanding murals in this country. High hopes, but the Latches family had the right man. Lajos Louis Jambor was born in Hungary on August 1, 1884. His father, John, was director of agriculture for the Hungarian government. Over initial resistance from his father, young Louis Jambor studied art in Budapest at the Royal Art Academy through a five-year scholarship. Subsequent scholarships allowed him to study religious art for three years in Germany and Italy. According to Catherine Alexander, Louis Jambor's granddaughter, now living in California, after Jambor completed his education and scholarship travel, he married a young woman who had caught his eye at a local church, and the two lived in Budapest. 
He was very successful as an artist in Europe, financially well off. He won a number of prestigious prizes and in 1923 was elected member of the Royal Academy of the Society of Art in Budapest. And that's a picture of him in his studio in Hungary. Hard at work, lots going on. The political and social upheaval in the years right after World War I disturbed Jambor. In 1922, he traveled to the United States to see if he could make a living here, and he felt confident he could. He found a home at 435 Riverside Drive facing the Hudson River in New York City. He then returned to Budapest and in 1923 with his wife, their 13-year-old daughter, Violet Bibi Jambor, who later still became Catherine Alexander's mother, and her two-year-old brother, Louis, Louis Jr., they emigrated to America. It is a pleasant coincidence that Louis Jambor and Demetrius Lachis were the same age, 37, when they came to the United States. Jambor almost immediately received portrait and church work. His paintings were exhibited and won prizes. He was very admired, said Catherine Alexander. Jambor became well known across America for his public murals, book illustrations, and religious paintings. His work was known for, quote, generous humanism and technical exactitude. There is indeed an endearing human warmth, warmth to much of his work, a genuine love of home and hearth, which comes through often. One of his best known works was the set of illustrations he did for the 1947 edition of Louisa May Alcott's Little Women. Jambour also illustrated the 1949 edition of the same author's book, Joe's Boys. Macy's and Gimbel's department stores also sold many prints of Jambour's series, Women Around the Piano, and the Gibson Greeting Card Company sold cards with his pictures. He also created the backgrounds for the 1939 animated version of Gulliver's Travels, for which he received a screen credit. And there you see Louis Jambour. Catherine told me that the people who made this film were trying to uh, compete and put Disney out of business, and I, I'm not sure it worked out well for them. <laughs> so. Warming up for his work here, he also painted murals in public buildings and hotels. In 1929, he painted murals for the newly completed Art Deco style Hotel New Yorker at 8th Avenue and 34th Street near the Empire State Building. Only two of the murals remain intact, according to Joe Kinney, an engineer employed at the hotel today. The balance of the 26 murals were covered over in a modernization of the hotel in 1948 and 1949. When I hear that, it makes me all the more glad that we still have these. Jambor also painted large murals above the proscenium in the Atlantic City Municipal Auditorium. He painted religious murals in churches in Buffalo, New York, Providence, Rhode Island, Middletown, Connecticut, and Erie, Pennsylvania. He painted two murals for Sisters of Mercy Chapel in Marion, Pennsylvania that are intact and displayed in the chapel today. Jambor and his wife donated his, his painting, The Last Supper, to the Riverside Church in New York City. That's The Last Supper. Catherine said he was known for the way he lit people, and you can get a sense of that here. He not only painted religious murals, but also religious paintings. His canvases bearing the titles Jesus of Nazareth, The Lord's Supper, The Nativity, Mother and Child have been extensively reproduced and widely distributed by religious organizations. The Lutheran Church distributed a great deal of his religious art worldwide, particularly Jesus of Nazareth. I remember that image from the church I grew up in. Jambor's painting, Why Do You Kill Each Other? was the focal point of the Protestant pavilion in the 1934 World's Fair. It's a little bit, a little bit darker. Since we are getting to know Louis Jambor tonight, it is important to appreciate him as a man of deep faith. He was very religious. He painted parts of his Christian religion that meant a lot to him, said Catherine Alexander. Finally, he was also a portrait artist of considerable talent. Commissions for portraits included Father Francis Duffy of New York, Lord Rothmere in London, the canonized Saint Mother Cabrini, and of course Demetrius Lachis, which he painted from a photograph. Here we have him again. 
Catherine said, the Latches family had heard he was a portrait painter. I think they liked the portrait enough that they offered him the mural work. Jambor's work on the Latches murals reflected his thoughtfulness as an artist and his mastery of technique. The reformer wrote, Mr. Jambor explained that the murals were not only derived from the mythology of Greece, but the very way they were painted on the wall was Greek, in contrast to the Roman fresco method. Mr. Jambor has remained faithful to the Greek art by using a combination of beeswax that fixes the colors and at the same time gives them the appearance of being watercolors. So two images of him at work here. It was also clearly arduous work, although he had help. Members of the staff here recall meeting people who assisted Jambor with parts of the murals. There is evidence of their labors. You can see drops of paint from their work on the floor behind Athena. When I saw those, it just, it just made everything um, come, come to life. It's amazing. Again in the reformer, climbing around scaffolding is strenuous work. Going up and down a tall ladder just for the purpose of changing colors is indeed an arduous task when it is repeated day in and day out. For this reason, a painter of murals must take a considerable rest period between commissions for such work. It's not clear whether the prolific Louis Jambor took the time to rest. He worked so hard because my grandmother kept giving away the money to young people going to seminary school. He was very admired by his colleagues. He worked until the day he went into the hospital and passed away, Catherine Alexander recalled. In addition to commercial success, Louis Jambor achieved recognition in the form of many prizes, including the gold medal from the Miami Women's Art League, the Gladys Ames Brannigan Memorial Prize, and the Allied Artists of America, and two awards in 1947 from the Salma Gundy Club in, of New York City. At his death, Jambor was national president of the American Artist Professional League, former longtime president of the Salma Gundy Club, former treasurer of the American Watercolor Society, and a member of the Allied Artists of America, and Audubon artist. I get the impression that he was what you might call a painter's painter, someone, his co someone who is much admired by his colleagues. Jambor was listed in the 1948 edition of Who's Who in America. When he died on June 11th, 1954, the New York Times ran an obituary and a photograph. According to the website GoAntiques.com, quote, Jambor's works are regularly at major U.S. and European auctions and his reputation is on the rise. The highest known sale price worldwide for a work by Jambor occurred in 2005 when a piece entitled The Picnic was sold for $37,500. Another notable sale was a painting entitled Washerwoman at Dusk, which sold for $20,700 in 1998. But of course, Louis Jambor is so much more than his resume and his auction prices. For Catherine, he was and always will be a puka, which is Hungarian for grandfather. He was a very quiet, deep, and loving man, she said. As a girl, I spent weeks in the summers with my grandparents in New York City, and how much I loved seeing one of my grandfather's paintings come to life, she said. She cherishes the memories of walking through parks with her apuka. He taught me to see the colors in the garden, woods, and everywhere, to notice the fern and moss on the side of a tree, for example. And he loved his family, she said. My grandmother had a beautiful operatic singing voice and was a devoted Christian, as was my grandfather, and always sang in her church's choirs. My grandmother was at my wedding in 1958 at Princeton Chapel, but passed away about two years later. She kept a beautiful home and made wonderful pastries and other delicacies. Her dream was to have a museum for my grandfather's pictures, but though she raised a lot of money, it was not enough by the time he passed away, said Catherine, who adds, now that I am a widow, I am considering what to do with the originals. There are many. I do not want to part with them either, as I saw many being created when I lived with them on Riverside Drive in New York City in the summers. I'd like to carry the story of this remarkable family forward a little bit. Catherine Alexander writes, since I was an only child, Jambor's son Louis was like a brother to me. He taught me ping pong and gave me so many of the books he liked. He loved dogs, large ones. He owned many and even brushed their teeth. Louis Jambor Jr. died about 10 years ago. 
Catherine's mother, née Violet Jambor, graduated with a degree in interior design in 1933 from Columbia University. She met her husband at the Riverside Church Young People's Group. He was here as a physicist and had arrived recently, coincidentally enough, from Hungary on a work scholarship. It turned out that they had lived only a few blocks from each other in Budapest before Catherine's family left when Catherine was 10, but they never knew each other then. They were married for 65 years. Catherine Alexander was born in New York City on November 19, 1934. Catherine's father was a physicist, physicist whose career reads like the history of important inventions of the 20th century. By the time he died, her father held more than 200 patents. He was involved in the development of the atomic bomb. He was also instrument in the invention of color television, battery-powered portable radios, the remote control, and a non-deteriorating fabric used for the American flag planted on the moon, for which he was the lead engineer. So we have, we have our zodiac ceiling up there, but uh, there's a Jambor connection all the way to the moon. Catherine's life has been pretty exciting, too. As a student, she worked as assistant librarian at a library at Princeton University, and among the people she met there was Albert Einstein. Catherine, however, aspired to be a defense lawyer and succeeded at a time when few women were pursuing careers in law. She told me her law school class included 160 men and three women. She also told me that she declined a marriage proposal which came with the provision that she stop her law studies. She went ahead with her career. She and the man she ultimately married, George Jonathan Alexander, had long and successful legal careers. In 1959, George and Catherine moved to Chicago, where she worked at the American Law Foundation, and she and her colleagues pioneered aspects of disability law. They had a daughter, Susan, and a son, George Jonathan. In 1972, they moved to Los Altos Hills, California, and she still lives in the home they moved into then. Catherine taught business law and administrative law at San Jose University, and then for 25 years, she was a Santa Clara County attorney in the Public Defenders Unit. Sometimes I painted, she said, but I do not have my grandfather's talent. Our children do, as I see from my daughter's doodles when she is on the phone or my son's designs. Some of Catherine's paintings do adorn the walls of the Catherine and George Alexander Community Law Center, where they establish a free law service for indigent people. Later, they established the Catherine and George Alexander Law Prize, and this year, the Catherine and George Alexander Law Professor Professorship Chair was established in memory of Catherine's husband at Santa Clara University School of Law. Chip Alexander, great-grandson of Louis Jambor and Catherine Alexander's son, and, and Catherine Alexander's son, graduated with a degree in physics from UC Berkeley and has gone on to a 25-year career working for many of the top companies in America. Catherine Alexander's daughter, Susan, has had a long career as an appellate lawyer in California. Susan's daughter, Catherine Alexander Eisenman, Graduated in 2015 magna cum laude from Middlebury College here in Vermont, majoring in architecture and environmental studies. Upon graduating, she and her roommate rode their bikes from Middlebury to Seattle and then down the coast to California. She has just recently begun working at a med meditation center in Bristol, Vermont. Work obligations prevented her from accepting our invitation to be here tonight, but she promised to visit soon to bring her family connection to us round in a great circle started by her great-great-grandfather while painting the murals of the Latches Theater right here in Brattleboro. Thank you. One of the most exciting aspects of this whole adventure putting together Hidden in Plain Sight was to uh, connect with Catherine Alexander. Um, it's been said that we found her. I don't think she was lost, but it's awfully glad that we made that connection. And she has been kind enough to send us a video since she couldn't be here in person tonight. So I'd like to have you meet Catherine Alexander. When my grandparents came to visit, I would often walk with my grandfather outside, just the two of us. And he taught me to see, to really see, looking out at the variant of colors, the way the light fell on trees. To see a blank canvas come to life and something beautiful, it's the most wonderful thing. 
Good evening. I'm Catherine Alexander, and I'm so lucky to have had Louis Jambor as my grandfather. I'm also lucky that Gordon Hayward found me in California, and thanks to you and your support in your special community, this is now preserved, and I thank you very much. My grandfather, and this is a picture of him, was born in 1884, and in the early 1900s, he ran away from home to enter the Academy of Art in Budapest, where he had a scholarship because his father wanted him to be an architect. And one day, he entered a Baptist church on a Sunday for the service and saw a lovely young lady who sang a beautiful solo, and he was smitten. And he then, after the service, inquired of the minister about her. It turned out it was the minister's daughter. Told the minister that he would like to come back when his education was complete and marry her if he could. And that's what happened. After he finished his education, he returned. They fell in love and had a wonderful 50-year marriage until he passed away. And by 1922, World War I was over, but things were still very chaotic in Hungary. He had by then two children, a daughter, my mother, 10 years old, and my uncle, who was two years old. He was very well known and successful as an artist in Europe by that time. Here is a picture of his studio. And even though he was financially extremely well off by then, he was very concerned about the fact that there were still chaotic situations going on, political problems in Hungary. So he left for a trip to the United States, to New York City, to see if he could make a living here and support his family. He made several arrangements, came back to Budapest, and with his wife and two children, returned to our country. He was a prolific artist. He has so many pictures that he did, so many portraits, so many murals. He did the Little Women and Joe's Boys books, which perhaps you're familiar with and I'll talk about again later. He did the illustrations for Gulliver's Travels. I'd like to give you a feeling for just how versatile he was. Perhaps you know this picture the best. This is his Jesus Christ, which is well known because the Lutherans and the Baptists made pamphlets and pictures, the World Church, and distributed them widely in the United States and internationally. You may know this picture. It's the Last Supper. It's famous for his lighting. His lighting is one of the brilliant things about his paintings, I'm told. To give you an idea of the versatility, this is a group of pictures of women around some musical instrument. It could be a harp or a violin, a piano. Prints were made of these, which Macy and Gimbel sold at the time. The series of mother and children, and then cards were made from Little Women, and the Gibson Card Company and other card companies got the rights to make all kinds of cards, Christmas holiday cards, Easter cards, which were sold in the 19, then 30, 40, 50, 60s. And the reason he did cards and prints is that my grandmother cried every time he sold a picture. And then my mother was the same way, she, so she cloistered a lot of them and wouldn't sell them, and now I have them. And I have a son and a daughter and three grandchildren, so I don't know what will happen to them, but I don't particularly want to sell them either. Perhaps you know the picture of, that's on the wall here on my right. It's Christ walking through dead bodies saying, why do you kill each other? It was the focal point of the Protestant pavilion in the World's Fair of 1934. A lot of postcards were made of that, and it hopefully made an impact on some people. Then going down is the painting of Cain and Abel, and to the left are the poker players, and that is a female at the table. My grandfather was an early women's lib. This is winter sunset. As you can see, the lighting, one of the things he's very famous for. This one is twinkle toes. This is the eucalyptus tree which you can see the lighting on it, but what's special about the eucalyptus tree, and you may probably know more about this than I do, is the way it sends its roots and branches, not under the ground, but as if there were arms to greet you. 
And so that's one of the things that he enjoyed about that tree. This is Sailing in the Breeze, a watercolor. For those of you who have done watercolors, you know the problems. And another watercolor, the peasants having to leave their home because of the chaotic conditions and wars, which is what troubled my grandfather. He came suddenly in the various internal parts of Hungary and people just had to pick up what they could put in a wheelbarrow and move with their families. Above the window over here is the reading lesson, for which I'm told I posed when I was six or seven years old. He won so many prizes and medals. This is the Brannigan Memorial Prize. I mentioned earlier the illustrations for the Little Women books. What happened was that I was with my grandparents in New York City a couple of weeks one summer, and the offer came in for him to illustrate the books, and he was going to reject it. And I explained to him it was one of my favorite stories. So the deal was I would describe to him the places that I would like to have illustrated, and he would paint them. And so he did, and I'm very lucky to have the earliest sketches then for that. And here they are. You remember when Jo told her neighbor that she wouldn't marry him, and the father was leaving, and then meeting his, the neighbor and the painting? You probably all know the story. And finally, my favorite. This is an oil painting of the peonies. Maybe tomorrow morning, when you walk out into your beautiful autumn, you can pretend he's with you and take a look at the variant of colors, enjoy the way the light falls on them, and maybe on a loved one. Thank you, good evening. Uh, I'd like to introduce our next two speakers. Um, the first is Angeliki Alexandri. Angeliki was born in Thessaloniki in northern Greece and educated in Greece and Switzerland. And she's presently employed by the National Gallery in London to organize and lead study groups comprised of major National Gallery donors to visit and learn from the great art museums of America and Europe. She will meet with her next group in Boston this coming Wednesday, which is why she's in the Northeast and is able to be here tonight. The National Gallery, which employs in the region of 600 people, is located on Trafalgar Square in central London. It houses the national collection of paintings in the Western European tradition from the 13th to the 19th centuries. And I might add that Angeliki is also our niece. <laughs> Anthony Tuck is going to uh, speak uh, to the content of the murals along with Angeliki. And you will learn in the process the relationship between the National Gallery and the furthest mural on this side, which is a direct quote from a very important painting hanging in the National Gallery. Anthony Tuck is an associate professor in the Department of Classics at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. In 1992, he earned a BA in classical archaeology from Haverford College. And in 1996, he earned a PhD in Mediterranean archaeology from Brown University. At UMass at Amherst, he has taught, among many others, courses in Greek mythology as well as Greek archaeology and art. So with that, I'd like to ask them to come up. Thank you. Good evening, all. Can you hear me? Hello, good evening, all. Delighted to be here. I think Anthony would like to start, and then I will follow. Oh, and then to... To echo that sentiment, I'm equally delighted to be here. Um, John began his, uh, his, his remarks tonight um, by talking about his almost daily experience of people coming into this space and being overawed by uh, such a remarkable piece of, of our shared past. Um, and I can, I can validate that because as of Monday of this past week, that was me and my children. And we walked into this space and all three of us looked up and, and were gen genuinely amazed by, uh, by the remarkable preservation um, 
but also the remarkable, uh, um, the, the thematic interconnections uh, that, that were so obvious and so present within this, uh, within this space. Um, in a conversation last night, uh, we were speaking and uh, Gordon made a wonderful observation as well in that we're surrounded by images drawn from Greek mythology or, or rather, maybe I should say classical mythology because uh, to broaden that to a certain degree. And uh, Gordon said, it's like an agora and that was a perfectly apt metaphor to understand not simply what these images are, but what this space is. And that this is a public space, a place where a community gathers together and, and formulates a shared experience and a shared, uh, a, a shared appreciation of this space. Um, now, again, uh, I, on, on Monday, as I first came into this space, and John said, well, you know, we never really had anybody who, uh, who, who interpreted the cycle of, of murals for us. Um, and people would come in and periodically look up and, and they would make up stories about, about these images, which again, I think is, is entirely appropriate in that it's very easy to see that there's tremendous meaning here, but we might not necessarily have an academic knowledge of what these communicate. Um, I often argue with my wife about the difference between things that are factual and things that are true. Um, and I would just seek to emphasize uh, that I think every story that's ever been told about these, uh, about these murals is a true story. Uh, it may not be the one that Jambor intended. It may not necessarily be the one that, a, that an archaeologist or a classicist will tell you it means, uh, but there's real truth in every retelling of these stories. Um, so we're going to begin this evening with, let's move on, with our image over here, this amazing image, and th this is my personal favorite of, of these particular scenes. Uh, we see here an image of, of Apollo, uh, who, who is up above the, uh, the, the arbor, and below the arbor we have these images of a, of a girl carrying two curious objects. She holds a lamp and she holds a knife, uh, and then she looks out at this young man who's sleeping on a bed. Uh, again, I, I'm, I'm immediately intrigued by what kind of stories this might inspire, um, but also certainly uh, impressed by the visual balance that this particular image has with the other to the other side that we'll come to in just a moment. From an academic's perspective and from a classicist's perspective, this is of course an image of the story of Cupid and Psyche. Uh, the story of Cupid and Psyche survives to us today in a form told by the Roman author Apuleius. Uh, Apuleius is just merely a very, very late and surviving version of this particular story, but images of this story uh, are known to us archaeologically at least as early as the 4th century BCE. Um, for those of you who might be unfamiliar with the story, let me just tell it in brief. Um, and I'll, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not normally prone to telling stories briefly, so I'll try to, I'll try, <laughs> try, to try to keep myself in check. Psyche is the daughter of a king. Uh, she has two sisters, and all three of the sisters of, of, of the king are remarkable for their beauty. In fact, the people of, of the city, and unfortunately, well, in, in, in Apuleius, the, the, the city is not named, um, but uh, the people of the city are so impressed by the beauty of these daughters, and especially Psyche, that they begin to commit an act of hubris. They begin to imagine that perhaps these girls are, are more beautiful than Aphrodite herself. Uh, Aphrodite takes offense at this, and she instructs her child, Eros, or Cupid, who, and, and the Roman and, and, and Greek versions of this are roughly interchangeable for the moment. Uh, so, so Eros, or Cupid, is then instructed by his mother to, to use his arrows, and you can see his arrows are over, well, here we are. The arrows are right over here. Uh, to use his arrows and shoot an arrow at, at Psyche and compel her to fall in love with a horrible monster. And this will then be Aphrodite's punishment. Cupid agrees to do this and picks up his arrows, but in so doing, he scrapes himself with one of his arrows and immediately falls in love with the next thing that he sees, and that is Psyche herself. So now Cupid and Psyche are, well, rather they are, they're, they're, that's, that's the, for the first element of the story that begins to bind these two characters together. Unfortunately, Psyche's father begins to worry that the people of his city are venerating his daughters to the detriment of Aphrodite. And so as a result, he, he then goes to Delphi. And Delphi is the sanctuary of the god Apollo. And we see Apollo up above the scene. The king learns from Apollo that Psyche is fated to fall in love with a dragon, with a monster. And at this point, the king then agrees to sacrifice his daughter to, to this particular monster. Uh, at which point Zephyrus, the west wind, lifts Psyche up and takes her to a palace. Now Psyche, 
uh, is then entertained by invisible music of lutes, and she dines by herself at a perfect and wonderful banquet, never seeing her future husband. Uh, finally, uh, at, the, at the end of, of, of her, her wedding night, uh, the lights are extinguished, and she's incapable then of seeing what her husband looks like. Uh, but she submits to him, and they go off to, the, to their marriage chamber together. But she never sees this. Now, over time, um, she, she, she becomes, uh, well, she's lonely. She, she is lonely. And, uh, and, and over time, uh, her wish is granted, and, and Cupid agrees to allow her sisters to come visit her. Her sisters then are borne up once again by the west wind and see this remarkable opulence in which she lives, and they immediately become jealous. So Psyche's sisters then begin to say, well, your husband is a horrible monster, and Psyche doesn't believe this, but she's not exactly sure. She then commits an act of faithlessness. Now, Cupid previously has told her that he'll never re reveal himself to her, um, but Psyche, knowing that he now is asleep, takes her, takes her lamp. She takes the lamp that we see here in the scene, and she approaches with the knife, prepared to kill her husband, thinking that he's a monster. But when she sees him revealed, she sees the beautiful Eros, the beautiful Cupid. But as she does, she's startled by his incredible beauty, and then she herself bumps into the arrows that he has left beside the bed. And she now is scraped by the same arrow, and she becomes possessed with the dragon of love at this point. Cupid then, right, so she backs away, and oil from her lamp spills onto Cupid, burning him and waking him up. He then realizes that his wife has been faithless to her promise to never look, uh, look upon him in the light, so he then flies away, and Psyche is now left to, uh, to well, to fend to her own devices, uh, but then to pursue her true love across a range of subsequent stories. All right, so Apuleius' story, um, and again, I would, re I would reiterate that Apuleius' story is simply, one, is simply one version that survives to us, and it's very clear that Apuleius' story captures a number of different dramatic episodes, but the narrative tension and, uh, and the narrative tension that Jean Bourg chooses to show us here is this moment of highest revelation. And while the illusion might not be immediately obvious to someone who isn't necessarily familiar with the story, I think it's fair to say that the choice of the scene is meant to communicate an appreciation of one of the most potent powers of theater, and that's its ability to reveal and to startle, to shock, and to remove us from ourselves and transport us into the story that we're told. The story continues on the other side of the theater. Now, again, Without going into too great a level of detail, Psyche eventually must descend to the underworld to prove her love to Eros, and she eventually is rewarded by Eros and introduced into the heavens. And so she then, at the end of the story, um, uh, she, she experiences what's referred to as the apotheosis of Psyche, that she becomes a divinity. And, uh, and at the end of the story, Cupid and Psyche become the idealized, divine, perfect young lovers. Um, however, we have this element of the story down below, or not the story, rather, we have this element down below, which, which at, at first glance perhaps is a little bit confusing, um, but once we begin to appreciate the subtlety and, um, and the texture that these murals communicate, it begins to make a bit more sense. We see here an image of a mother nurturing two children. Uh, one has longer hair, the other shorter, because one is a girl and the other is a boy. Now, these, as we can see, here, we can see here in this particular image, in this image of a sculpture, which now today is on display in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City uh, by William Henry Reinhardt, which dates to 1874, that Jean Bourg is, again, he's a resident of New York City at this point, and certainly is aware of this particular image, and takes this image and incorporates it into this mural. Now this, as you can see over here, uh, wrapped up over here, is Latona. Now Latona is the Roman name for, uh, for a Greek divinity, Leto. Um, and Leto is the mother of the divine twins Artemis and Apollo. We see again Apollo over here on this fresco, and over here we see Apollo in his infancy. Apollo, and the reason why this is so essential to understanding Jean Bourg's overarching motivation in the construction of these murals, Apollo is a divinity associated with a number of things. Um, uh, he is a divinity associated with the sun. He's a divinity associated with archery. Uh, but most importantly for our purposes, he's a divinity associated with song, with music, and with performance. Now, from this point, I want to turn things over to Angeliki for a moment, and we'll talk a little bit more about Jean Bourg's use of, of the art historical tradition to create a space like this. 
And then I would like to add to Tony's fantastic and very accurate comments that um, another god who is very strongly related to performance is Bacchus and is, who is the, not only the god of wine, but the god of theatre, one of the gods of theatres and performance. And Bacchus is illustrated in the, in the mural towards the back of the theatre, and I'm not familiar with the slides, so I will need your help with that, please. Thank you. And Bacchus is actually the, the figure to the left-hand side with the enormous drapery, exactly that. And this is where the link with the National Gallery comes into place. Um, because as, um, as Ajambor used the, used the sculpture by, how do you pronounce his name? Forgive, Reinhardt. Reinhard. Thank you. Uh, as his inspiration for his own work and for the mural that we see on that side of the theatre, he used a painting, a masterpiece by Titian, a Renaissance um, painting, a uh, 16th century Venetian painter on which he based his um, mural to the left. And the, you can see the original painting just on the right-hand side. Um, so the figure with the drapery is Bacchus. Um, and then the figure, uh, the, the two figures on, on its side are Bacchus followers. And in the original painting, which is called Bacchus and Ariadne, is, um, is a wonderful story. It's about Bacchus coming back uh, from India and coming to the island of Naxos where he meets Ariadne. And Ariadne, I don't know if you're familiar with the story, um, she was left, she was abandoned on the island of Naxos by Theseus, um, who is the prince of, uh, an Athenian prince, uh, who was helped by Ariadne to kill the Minotaur in Crete. Ariadne is lamenting on the, on the island of, Ac of Naxos. She wakes up, she realizes that she has been abandoned, and then here where, it's here when she meets Bacchus for the first time. Um, Bacchus uh, has just come back from the journey from India. He arrives with his chariot. Uh, he's followed by uh, satyrs and menads. Um, who were his followers. And Bacchus represents, as Tony said, uh, he's another god of performance, of theater. So there is another link to the story of the theater and what the theater reveals to us. I think Jean Bohr has chosen to exclude Ariadne in, on, in, this, in this case. Um, so it's interesting to see how Jean Bohr uses other artists and kind of takes elements from their work and their art and adapts them um, to the situation, to the commission. Um, and so Titian did exactly the same. Titian used to, he used actually Greek art sculptures um, and classical works um, to create his art. And actually the drapery, uh, the inspiration bit behind the drapery on Bacchus is very much inspired by Greek uh, anti uh, antiquity sculptures. Um, and, it's an, and it's an interesting art historical convention. So Jean Bon continues this tradition, this tradition and as Titian, he, he uses a wonderful, very famous masterpiece of Western art, of Renaissance art. He brings it in this theater and then he does something very similar with a painter and the painting by Sargent, which is the next slide, I suppose. Um, which was a recent discovery, I must say. Um, it's the painting, as you can see, of, it's a painting depicting Chiron and Achilles. Um, and as you can see, the inspiration behind the paint, behind the mural, Jean Borge mural, is the painting on the right, um, which is a painting by a sergeant, and it's actually on display at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. So it's fascinating uh, to see how Jean Borge takes elements from, um, the wide tradition of art history and art and brings them and adapts them according to what his commission is and what he's interested in, in showing at the time. And I think Tony now will say a few more words about the meaning of uh, the mural of Cairo. Um, bear with me. I, I'm not good in pronouncing Greek words in English, so bear with me. <laughs> That's not an easy task. <laughs> so, Chiron uh, and Achilles, as we say in Greek. So, Tony will take over from here and I'll be happy to answer any questions if I can to in the end, but thank you. <laughs> So Jambor's classical training, uh, both as an artist and a storyteller, should be relative, should, should certainly be obvious to us at this point. Um, and while Apollo, as, as we spoke about before, 
is a god very closely associated with poetry uh, and the performance uh, of song. Um, theater, specifically theater, both from a historical and also from a, from, from a mythological perspective, has its origins in the strange and the chaotic rituals of the rural space. Um, theatrical performance arises out of not terribly well understood, but very ultimately rather disturbing rituals associated uh, with the god Dionysus. So our image of, of Bacchus or Dionysus here in, in John Boer's scene is one uh, which is informed by Roman models. Um, and no, I'm an Etruscan archeologist, so I'll just speak about this very, very briefly. Um, the, the image of a young Bacchus or a young god of wine is actually an image that the Romans adopt not from the Greeks, but rather from the Etruscans. Um, Bacchus and Dionysus are very frequently considered to be equivalent divinities, but it's important to recognize that Bacchus actually, again, has its origins in an Italic idea about divinities of wine as opposed to the earlier Greek ones. I'm quite confident Jambor didn't care. <laughs> um, ultimately, his interest here is in the representation of a scene of Dionysus. And again, the archaic Greeks, uh, the Greeks of the 7th and 6th centuries BCE, conceived of Dionysus as a bearded man, as you can see up over here. And very often, Dionysus is represented as nothing more than a mask, which is placed on a post, and then the post is then dressed, in, uh, usually with clothing or vegetation, as you can see here on this vessel, which was produced in the late 6th century BCE. So if we can pause for a moment and just consider the idea of masks, especially at this time of year, I mean, Halloween is upon us. And so it's very easy to appreciate how the moment of revelation, such as that of the revelation of Ariadne or the revelation of Psyche, is also a moment of transformation. And the mask of Dionysus, just like the theater of Dionysus that you see here in this image in Athens, and Athens permeates this space in ways I'll get to in just a moment, these are, are both, both the space of the theater and the mask of Dionysus are instruments of tremendous power. The mask in the theater possess the power to transform the wearer and the audience within the theater to open doorways into imagined spaces and identities beyond our own limited realities. The final element of Chambord's series communicates what I think is probably one of the most subtle messages of this entire space, but also probably the most important. And again, as Angeliki just said, we see Chiron the centaur uh, with a young boy riding on his back. And as with so many murals within this particular space, we have another quotation of a contemporary artist, John Singer Sargent uh, from Boston. And Chiron, for those of you unfamiliar with, with the myth of Chiron, uh, or the narratives associated with Chiron, Chiron is a character associated with education and teaching. Um, he's, he serves in a number of stories as an instructor and guide to several of Greek mythology's great heroes. And of course, at one level, the space of a theater is clearly an instructional one. Uh, it's a place wherein we can learn of other perspectives and other experiences, but I don't know that that's the extent of John Bohr's message here. Education is a reciprocal and evolutionary process. Between teacher and student, there's an implied contract that the responsibilities of learning do not end with the student. Instead, the student must become the teacher, otherwise the chain is broken. And this essentially, this is the essential generational responsibility that we have, that we, excuse me, the responsibility that, uh, that our, our, our forebears uh, redeem through us and the responsibility that we redeem through our children. And beside the image of Chiron and Achilles, is a remarkable, truly remarkable relief representation of a small round structure, which you see in through here or up over here. And you can even see it's, it's, it's so beautiful and so remarkable how it literally comes out of the wall into our space. Um, the shape, the relief frieze, which is indicated on, uh, on the relief, um, both indicate that Jean Bohr and the architects of the theater were quoting from a building that has stood in Athens since the fourth century BCE. The Lysicrates Monument stands today on the streets of the tripods, uh, just below the Acropolis of Athens. And you can see right here, this is the Acropolis rock and the, the walls of the Acropolis rising up above the street of the tripods. 
It was originally one of, of several similar monuments. Uh, we don't know how many there, actually, there originally were, but, but this was not the only one. Um, this one, this particular one, happens to have survived because it was incorporated into a Capuchin monastery in the late medieval uh, and, uh, and Renaissance periods. In fact, in the early years of the 19th century, um, when Lord Byron was in Athens, he stayed at this monastery and used the Lysicrates monument as his library while he was there. But the monument was obviously originally something rather different. In order to celebrate uh, the victory of a choral ode in a festival, as well specifically the festival of, Di of Dionysus, which typically would occur at about this time of year, the ode's patron, uh, a wealthy man named Lysicrates, paid for the construction of this monument. Now, the ode doesn't survive, uh, nor does the name of the ode's author, but Lysicrates and the monument of his patronage, that does survive. And it's here that I think we can see and appreciate the texture and nuance intended by the creators of this space. The theater is part of our shared history and it remains a monument to the energy and vision of its original creators. But in order for our custodianship of this space to be redeemed, it's our obligation to protect it for future generations. It is increasingly so rare for places like this one, places where the past is so perfectly preserved and presented to survive in a world that is dictated and distracted by the Walmarts and Netflixes that inflict upon us all. But maybe because it is so rare, we can appreciate how a place like, like the Latches Theater performs a remarkable act of alchemy, taking the past and the present to guide us into our future, but only if we appreciate its legacy, the, the legacy that we've inherited and accept the responsibility that it bestows upon us. So thank you all very much. Thank so. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's incredible. So I'm going to set a scene, and the scene is someday last January, and we're all very cold. And it's some early weekday morning and my coffee hasn't kicked in and I'm well hunkered against January and probably have the third cold of the season that my kids have given me and um, trying very hard to uh, have a happy day. And into the Latches walks Walter Collier Nikolai. And he has been a friend of the Latches for a long time. I didn't know that at the time. I knew him a little bit from uh, other life experiences, but um, he walked in and he said the most in incredible thing. He said, I think you have another statue and I'd like to fix it for you. And that began uh, what has been now a eight or nine or ten month journey uh, that will end um, very soon with a word that uh, Tony used a lot, which is a reveal. But before we do that, I'd like Walter to come up so he can reveal a little bit about his experience uh, rebuilding Clio for us. So Walter, would you please come up? I'm Walter Collier Nikolai. It's nice to see all of you tonight, um, particularly friends um, who I've known these past years, uh, eight years, Judith Berkeley. A uh, dear friend who's here tonight, and uh, I'm blessed to know her. The Latches Theater, um, in 1938, established a program with regard to not only murals, but also with regard to sculpture. Now, sculpture is an interesting thing in that it engages space. And it engages space in a way where we have no other response except that we either have to react to it and admire it, or we have to find it to be too much for us to deal with and we back away from it. For this reason, sculpture becomes incredibly important in the world. The three dimensions of height, width, and depth are critical for us as human beings to engage with, and we engage with them in our viscera, right between here and down here in our gut response. I walked into this theater in 1990 in the middle of a snowstorm. 
I had been appointed as an adjunct sabbatical replacement for one semester at Keene State College. It was the middle of winter, it was lonely in Keene. I was sitting in Elliott uh, Alumni House and off in the distance was a beacon that blinked on red and then off, and then on red and then off. And it really struck in a chord in me where I felt incredibly lonely and I was like, this is gonna drive me crazy unless I get out of this town. So got in my car, little road trip. I had heard about Brattleboro, Vermont, heard that it was a pretty groovy town. And I came over here and I stopped at Llama, Tucan, and Crow, which some of you might remember. It was the only place open at that time. And then I came down the street with my food checking everything out. It was pretty late at night. The only thing that was open was this place called the Latches Theater. And I walked into the front lobby and I was like, wow, what is this place? Art Deco on the outside. There are not too many Art Deco buildings that actually exist in the world. Art Deco is an incredibly short period of time in the history of design. And then on the inside was this fellow who was standing there, his name was Ed Chafee, and he was smoking a camel straight and his hair was slicked back. And he's like, yeah, this is a pretty amazing place, isn't it? <laughs> and I walked into the lobby and I saw the zodiacs on the floor, the zodiac images. And I saw the fountain there and I saw a standing figure at that time, Athena was standing there. She didn't have a hand and she had no spear. And, uh, and I looked at the sculpture and I was like, this is really, what is this place doing here in Brattleboro, Vermont? <laughs> and the guy who was there, Ed Chafee, took me around. At that time, he could still smoke inside the building. And he, there weren't many people in the theater, and uh, he walked me around, and, and I walked into this space, and I was just like, oh my word, this is, there's a lot more going on here than, than what meets the eye. So Ed and I became fast friends. And to make this a, a shorter story, he said, you know, they need some help with sculpture there. Maybe you could trade some movie passes for I was like, Ed, come on. And uh, he said, all right, all right. I just thought it, maybe you might be interested. In this. So I got to thinking about it. I said, Ed, what, when do you uh, show the movies over there at the theater? And he said, oh, Friday at 5 o'clock. Why don't you come on over? And you can see the place again and look at it. And, and uh, Jim Latches was here at that time, and we worked out a deal. And uh, the deal was basically that I was going to get a little bit of money and some movie passes in exchange for working on the sculpture. We started with her, Athena. And uh, she got a hand, and she got a spear. That was back in... 2000 and, no, excuse me, 1995. It was in 1994-95. And uh, let me see whether we've got, whether, I'm not very good at technology. Some of you might know that. I'm better with the chisel. Cleo is the muse of history. These are two images from the Vatican collection. The previous image, if I can go back here, this is from Pompeii, 79 AD. Uh, Cleo is written, according to uh, uh, Dr. Tuck, who spoke here uh, just previous to me, um, Cleo is uh, recorded uh, in the Hesiod. Um, I'm not saying that properly, but that'll have to do. In the seventh, eighth, seventh century BC. These are the only two images I had to work from in terms of restoration. 
These are in the Vatican collection in Rome. I, I wanted to make a trip there, but I don't think they'd spring for it. <laughs> and then this is an image uh, done by an artisani. An artisani is a, a highly trained craftsman from Italy. Uh, this is in the Besto Bio Garden down in Texas. This is an image from Gettysburg of Cleo from the Gettysburg War. Cleo is the muse of history. She writes history. But I think she also tells us history. And uh, it's a reflexive process, in other words. There's the intuition of Cleo looking at us and seeing history, but then also telling us history. This is my interpretation. So this was the first sculpture um, that got some work done on it. Uh, the snake had been in six pieces when Jim Latches gave it to me. Uh, there was no spear. Uh, the right hand was missing. And there were some other places that needed touch up. The next statue uh, that I worked on was in 2002. This is Hebe. Uh, that's me as a younger man. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to figure out how the hell you hold a, a mug like a uh, pouring device. I think uh, uh, we might call it a hydria. I'm not sure. Um, in and pour into a kylix. Uh, both arms were in bad shape. The right arm didn't exist. The kylix didn't exist. Uh, the upper arm was all pitted out. The back side of the sculpture was completely rotted out. Um, water and plaster, they don't go well together. So, uh, so uh, in 2002, I worked on this sculpture. And, and this sculpture has never been touched. It's been in great shape all these many years. Talia, the muse of song and dance, as you look at this stage, uh, we have Talia on one side, and on the other side is Cleo, the muse of history. So we have the muse of theater, dance, song on one side, and we have history on the other. Whoever put this together knew what they were doing. These are balancing acts for a theater. Uh, we have to know something about history in order to be able to celebrate it and to understand it in our lives. We also have to know something about dance in order to celebrate our joys and our sorrows. The first catalog that exists of uh, Caproni. Uh, these are all Caproni statues. Amongst people in art education, they're very well known because they were the training ground of artists in the United States starting uh, in the late 1800s and on into the 1900s. In other words, if you went to an art academy, you would be standing or sitting in front of a Caproni statue and drawing it um, nude models were not used in the late 1800s. Uh, uh, you would get in trouble um, if you had nude models. And uh, there are great stories in the history of art education of nude models creating problems for professors. <laughs> so this is the 1901 catalog. This sculpture of Cleo over here, which um, we're calling it a restoration. It's really not. It's a reconstruction of a sculpture. Um, the one that's under the black over here um, exists in this catalog. It does not exist in this catalog. This raises a very interesting question. A 1901 sculpture, this catalog's from 1911, a 1901 sculpture somehow made its way into the Latches Theater here. 
how was this purchased? What was the process? Was it a leftover? What was the situation? Who knows? Uh, this is the oldest sculpture uh, in the latches, uh, Cleo, Cleo, right over here. So the interior of Caproni, Caproni is a very interesting man. He came here um, to the United States in the 1880s, 1890s, and somehow he was able to bring to the United States uh, cast casting forms uh, from Italy. And these casting forms, a lot of them are derived from the major collections all over Europe. So these are the positives, and uh, if you were interested in purchasing murals um, uh, that were relief sculpture, you would go to uh, Caproni's warehouse in Boston, and you could purchase uh, the various uh, three-dimensional work that you wanted for theater. Please keep in mind um, the 1920s in the United States is a period of time of one of the greatest archaeological finds in the history of art and architecture. Uh, that would be King Tut's tomb. And there is the renewal and reinterest in everything classical in that period of time. It's the neoclassical period of time that takes place. Um, and the revival of neoclassical as well as anything antique, um, and, and that's true with regard to um, all cultures being, people are fascinated in all cultures, and particularly in the United States since our history uh, was not that old at that point in time. So this is the Caproni Warehouse in Boston. Another image of the Caproni Warehouse in Boston. And uh, now um, we're going to take a look at Cleo. Um, I've asked my co-worker, my co-laborer, Travis Stout, to uh, help me out with this um, in that he's a little bit more nimble than I am. I entered my 60th year of life last, sat last Saturday, so uh, I'm less inclined to climb up and uh, do this. This was, this is the torso that was here. Good, walk over with that. Thank you. Take it over. Thank you. I'll stay here. This is what we had of the torso. This is the reconstruction note, the great use of things from the theater here to uh, fabricate the head. This is me trying to figure out what I'm doing. This is on a cold day and uh, quite a while ago. This is, again, uh, trying to figure out what's going on here. My motto is build it once, build it twice, build it three times, you probably have it. There it is again. That's me uh, looking intense. And then finally getting uh, some progress done with regard to uh, the sculpture. And that's today. Uh, and uh, if you were to look at my shoes, you'd see there's still plaster on my shoes. Uh, you can read between the lines. And that's hauling it into the theater. Thank you, Travis. Thank you very much. So we were going to have a musical play out, but uh, something came up for the musicians involved. Um, but I'm not sure we could really top that uh, anyway. And I want to thank you all very much for coming to this very special evening. It's great to have you all here. And welcome home, Cleo.